In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When Jesus Christ was crucified, Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The chief priests contested this, saying that it should state, This man said, I am King of the Jews. But Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Whether Pilate believed what he was writing, or if he just did it to provoke the Jews, we will never know. But we do know what Jesus confessed to him. Jesus confessed that he was and is a king. Jesus said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. This meant that the inscription on the cross was 100% accurate. We understood this to be true last Sunday as well, as Jesus entered Jerusalem to cries of Hosanna in fulfillment of the prophet, prophecy of Zechariah, who said that your king would come riding on a donkey. Jesus entered Jerusalem as a king, and he was rightly labeled as king when he was crucified. What it meant that Jesus was the king of the Jews goes all the way back to the book of Judges. In the time of the judges, God ruled the people directly through prophets and different leaders called judges. However, during this time, the Israelites sought to be like their neighbors. They sought to have a man be their king and to rule over them as in a kingdom. This meant that they were rejecting God to be their king over them, but regardless, God granted their request. Yet along with it came the problems that come with kings. The first king was Saul. He was anointed by God's prophet Samuel to be the king of the people. 1 Samuel 9 describes Saul as a handsome young man who among the Israelites there was none more handsome than he. He was even taller than any of the people. He seemed a good choice to be king. Once anointed king, Saul served the people and God well, uniting them all under one kingdom. However, it was not like that for long. Saul's first sin was failing to destroy everything that God told him to devote to destruction. In defeating the Amalekites, God told Saul to destroy everything, but Saul kept what was good for himself. God said to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. So God chose to anoint a new king. The second king was David. After David was anointed for this task, Saul continued to be unfaithful to God. <clears throat> Saul refused to let go of the kingdom. So the two men fought, with David eventually winning out, it was clear that King Saul was no good to be king. David, on the other hand, was known for his faithfulness, but he was also known for his most notorious sin. Despite how great David looked as king, his downfall began with him failing to go out to battle. David stayed home. This 2 <clears throat> Samuel 11 says that it was the time of year that when kings would go out to battle. However, this sin of David's led him to lusting after Bathsheba, committing adultery with her and killing her husband in order to cover it up. Just as Saul before him, David had not performed the commandments of God. He was unfaithful to his calling as king. The third king was David's son, Solomon. David was promised by God that one of his offspring would be established as king forever. This initially seemed like it would be completely fulfilled in Solomon, as King Solomon was known for his wisdom and wealth. God had blessed him with each of these and had grown the kingdom to even greater lengths. With all of this wealth, Solomon was faithful to God and built him a glorious temple. Sacrifice after sacrifice was offered to God there. All of this seemed perfect until Solomon, too, turned his back from following God and did not perform his commandments. 
through his 700 wives and 300 concubines, which itself was not what he should have been doing, he was influenced to worship false gods. 1 Kings 11 says that his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and built places to worship the false gods and even made sacrifices to them. Therefore, among the past kings of the Jews, not one fulfilled the great task given to them. None of them remained faithful and none of them was any better than when God ruled over his people directly. This brings us back to Jesus Jesus was called the king of the Jews, and he most certainly fulfilled that task. Unlike Saul, Jesus did not disobey the commandments of God. Jesus lived his life faithfully according to them, being a teacher of them to others. Jesus was obedient, as the epistle reading from Hebrews described. And as Philippians 2 says, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Unlike Saul, who was full of himself and refused to give up the kingdom when David was anointed the new king, Jesus gave up his life when that is what was required of him. Think of when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to his father, pleading that this would pass and that he would not have to die on the cross. Yet with each petition, he also said, your will be done. Jesus remained faithful to his purpose of dying on the cross. Unlike Solomon, Jesus did not give in to the temptations that came with power and wealth. When Jesus was tempted by the devil with power over the whole world, Jesus said no. Our epistle reading says that Jesus, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knew what was important to his task, and it was not material wealth or fame. Jesus' glory was the opposite of earthly glory. Some expected him to rise up and overthrow the Romans who were ruling over the Jews, but Jesus never sought to do that. Jesus went on the road to the cross and stuck to it, never sinfully deviating. Jesus' glory as king was found in the cross no matter how backwards it was in comparison to the wealth and riches of Solomon. Unlike David, Jesus did not fail to go out to battle. As the king does, Jesus led the attack on our enemies of sin, death, and the devil. He went out on the path to the cross because it was on the cross that he faced these enemies head on. In the hymn after the sermon, we will sing about this glorious reality. We will say, Sing my tongue, the glorious battle. Sing the ending of the fray. Now above the cross, the trophy, sound the loud triumphant lay. Tell how Christ, the world's redeemer, as a victim, won the day. Jesus' death on the cross was him winning the battle and ending the war. By becoming the victim and bearing our iniquities, he brought us peace, and with his stripes, we are healed. All of the suffering and torture, including the nails through his hands and feet and being hoisted up above the earth, was the victory he won as your king. Dearly beloved, Good Friday is not a funeral service for Jesus. Good Friday is not a day to feel sad for Jesus. Good Friday is the day that Jesus was enthroned king with a crown made of thorns and a cross for a throne. When he was enthroned as your servant king who serves all through his victory over your enemies by dying in your place, his kingdom will last forever and his kingdom was rightfully restored, has rightfully restored God's direct rule over you. When we look to the cross and see the crucified Jesus, we are sorrowful over our sin that sent him there, but we rejoice in his actions as our king to win for us the eternal victory. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen.